Pakistan and welcome to my today's session which is part two of data visualization. I hope you enjoyed my first session and we are going to have a lot more fun today. So let's go and dive deep into what data visualization is and what we are going to learn today. So before I start, I would like to summarize quickly what data visualization means. So it is basically just getting your data, simplifying it, cleaning the data, doing some sort of data wrangling, and then basically presenting it into a graphical manner. Why present in a graphical manner, not in a tabular format, is the reason behind that is there are certain underlying trends, outliers, and patterns that are hidden in the data, which are only visible when you present them in a graphical format. And then is the only way you can make certain data-driven decisions. It also helps you to illustrate certain figures when you have done some research, gathered the data, and you want to publish it in form of uh, papers and journals and articles and books. So it is always better to have some sort of visualizations. So let's move forward and see what we learned in the last week session. So we learned how to load data and we saw two formats, either a simple import or a semantic um, import. And then we uh, saw a couple of how to clean the data, look at the data. Understanding of your data is very important because unless you do not understand the data, how it is available to you, it is not possible to have graphical representation for that. You will get errors and then you say, why am I getting certain errors? The reason may be the data is not formatted in a manner which you can play around. We will also see a couple of examples today also how to clean your data, how to handle certain data which have zero values or null values, or and we will see that as an example as well. So last week, we also studied line charts, scatter plots. I also shared with you the package file for the two axis plot, and then we did two exercises. So on the same pattern, today what we are going to do is we are going to move forward and we'll see what other charting and visualization information are available. So we will look at certain examples, we will, how we can uh, visualize distributions, how we can uh, find the trends hidden in the distributions or in your data. I will also today uh, tell you some more visualizations related to financial examples and geographical visualization. So it, today's session is a little bit different how I drafted my previous one. So I'm not going to give you any tutorial what a bar chart is, how you write it in Wolfram language. We will today directly dive deep into these four real life examples. And while we are exploring these examples, you will learn how these functions are available, how you can use them, where to use this type of graph is very important. And I will summarize in the end by telling you what is the suitable plot or a graph you can uh, you can get. So which graph is suitable for what type of data is very important to understand and we'll take a look of that as well. So let's go forward and we will, I'll hide my picture from here so that you have more space for the uh, looking at the uh, things. So let's go forward and I'll start with the uh, example. And we will dive deep into this example and we'll learn from this how certain types of uh, functions are done and what they, how they, you can solve them as well. So my first example today is about uh, a real life example. So for example, I want to develop a video game. 
and I love Mario Kart V game. And I wanted to develop a similar game in V. But before I start on my work, I wanted to know what will be the response of the uh, people who will be using that game. So I have, I, I make my game in the right format and I choose a right category to do that. So the easiest way of what I found is to get the result how the experts rank the games. So I thankfully someone has uh, formulated our data from IGN game reviews which where the experts ranks the games from 0 to 10 in uh, from 0 which means the disaster well or 10 to the uh, game like the masterpiece and I'll show you over here uh, if I'm able to drag it yes so this is the website IGN and the many people who plays game they come on this website and they share their experiences from the games and someone has thankfully made a data file for this which we will now use to uh, take this analysis so the first part is to load the data and as I mentioned earlier we can do a semantic import so I have a game data excel file which is available in my uh, hard disk and I will import that file into my notebook session so once it is imported it is also necessary to review the data so I can see how many entries are there so there are almost like 17,000 500 plus entries about the games we can take a look on the first five so game data is the variable where I saved all of this information and I take the span of one to five and I can see that the games are mentioned over here the platform is also mentioned and the experts average score and the general is also mentioned over here so based on this data, I can do certain explorations and see which is the right platform or what type of game should I develop so that I get a maximum response from the uh, users. So the first step to get to that answer is to see which is the most used platform. So in order, because you see in my data, there is a platform available. So how many games are made in each platform? So I can do something like game data and I can say, okay, group by, and I will group it by platform. So when I do it like that, what I will get, I'll get all the game data and it is sorted by or grouped by the platforms. So I can see how many games are in each platform. Xbox One has 35, BU has 78, PlayStation has three. A graph, good graphical representation of there is available. So, but what I can do further, I can say, okay, game data, but this time I need to see a tally, like how many games per platform is available. So I can write game data, which is my variable. Tally is basically giving me how many games each. And then I give the platform and I map. So I can see, okay, I have 35 games in Xbox One. I have 78 games in Wii U. PlayStation 3 is 1,295. But why not I just also give it a reverse sort. So what reverse sort by will give me is the result so that I can now sort it. So the most games are now sorted on the top. So I can see more than 3000 games are developed in PC. 1600 in PlayStation 2, 1500 in different categories. So I can take these and I can get an understanding of uh, from here that which platforms are more famous in the uh, players around the world. 
I do not want to have a list of all of them or I just want to see where the top of them are. So maybe I can just take the top 10 values over here. So I can use like again the span and I can say, okay, just give me the top 10 over here or the famous 10. And let me save this as a, another value like famous 10 and maybe write a note for me for my future calculation what this is thing. So taking top 10 famous platforms. So you know by mentioning a static comma on both sides, this will not be executed and this can be a good note for me. Or I can just put a semicolon over here and I can also hide this. So once I have this, I can also make a maybe a bar chart of that. And similarly, in my last session where we use the labeled command, so we are doing the same over here, where I'll do a sort and I'll say it to give me certain values, like label for the values from the reverse thing, and then map the other one on the uh, first thing, like which platform it is, and then I map it on this famous 10. And I close bracket over here. So this is telling me I'm missing something. Let me see what I am missing over here. And you see, I can have a bar chart. Now, you see, because the, li the label values are big, like PlayStation, and it's, it's all jumbled up. So is there any way I can quickly see it in a more aesthetic manner over here? So maybe I can just mention over here like bar origin, and I can say, make it on the left. So now I can see I can have a more better representation. I can also read these labels more better. But is this giving me, is this looking at this graph giving me some uh, information? Yes, it is telling me in exact values. But I, I want to see also uh, like a composition of this, how this combines together in a in, in, in a hundred person type of a situation. So maybe I can take this from here the same and I can say, okay, instead of bar chart, maybe I'll see a pie chart. And from here, it quickly looking at this, I can say, okay, PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and B, these are the four top main platforms being used by the uh, developers, mostly for, for game preparations. So this is, I'm lining you up to understand what type of graphs and visualization makes more sense depending on what you want to see and how your data is uh, available to you. So now I have all the information, which is the most used platform. So I see PC, PlayStation, Xbox, V are mostly used. So I get an idea in which platforms I should be preparing these uh, games for. But let's calculate the total for all of this also maybe. We have done all of these things. I calculated the total, I took the top 10 platforms, we make a bar chart of this, and we also make a pie chart for this. So all of these things we have done over here to get an understanding for that. Now, let's go to the second step. Now, because you remember that I wanted to develop a game in racing. So I need to understand how the racing game is divided into these platforms which platforms out of these is more good or more have more success in, in the racing games and how I can do that. So first of all, I have to get a list of all the racing games. So again, because we have the data available, I say, let's look at the game data. And this time I'm going to use a select command. And I know that from the top that the racing is under Genar. So I can say, okay, let me go over here and select by Genar. So I'll give this and I'll say, okay, this should be is equal to 
and I have to look at the racing. So this has to be is equal to racing and I want to see the uh, all these things like score. I also want to uh, see the uh, platform, which platform is available and the other uh, what other things are available to us. Let's go and see. So we have platform, score and we have a game. Maybe let's also have a game. So we, may, we exactly know which game was more famous. And we can go and we can call this. So now what I have, I have all the uh, scores, platforms and games which are from the racing category. And maybe also I apply this like reverse sort on this to see which games get the maximum score out of that. And I'm saving this as a variable called racing games. So these are a list of all the racing games with this score and in an ascending manner, the highest score to the lower score. Okay. So once we have now have this uh, uh, get racing data, the other thing uh, which we, we would like to go forward and see is how much games are in racing games in each category. So similarly, okay, so now I have the list of all the racing games platforms. So we can simply do a tally like we did earlier and we say racing games and we take the second value for that and let's do the uh, So we have the games and tell like how many games in each platform. So there are five racing games in this platform. There are more than 100 games in this PlayStation platform. So maybe we also need to, I always like to see them sorted. So, so let's sort them in uh, I made a mistake. So maybe it goes. Okay, so let me see where I'm making a mistake. So we are doing result for tally, we are taking the normal values, we have the racing games, we have the second column. Uh, okay, the normal should be here. Okay. So we have now by reverse sort, we have all of these games and their corresponding tallies and uh, because I only wanted to have the platforms from here so you see that the platform is on the the first so if I take this part and I say part of like all of one so I have all of these platforms over here and because I noticed that all of these platform I'm not interested I'm only interested in the top someone so maybe just take the top uh, 15 out of them so again I implement the span one and take the top 50 so these are the list of the top 50 platforms which are used in the racing games and maybe we call this into a variable called race platforms so now we have all the top 15 race platforms but we are not only interested in seeing the exact each game value. We also want to see the mean square, mean value of all of these things. So we like, for example, I can say racing games and I say, okay, select. I want to see which platform have the more uh, uh, better score uh, overall, not individual game by all, like in a specific platform. So I will select by the platform. And I want to see first because I know all the games are in PC most of time. So I'll select it by PC and I'll take the uh, score from there. So these are all the games, racing games, which have been developed in PC format, the scores for them. And now it is very easy for me to, if I just take the mean of all of this. So because I have all the values and I can use mean function on this command l is used command l takes the upper one input so i have the and i can see in the pc game 
the average score of all the racing game is 7.012. Now, if I change this platform to any other platform, it will give me the, uh, the value of that platform as well. So maybe I'll make a, um, what should we do? Let's make a function out of this. Yeah. So we have calculated the mean. Let's keep make a function out of this so that we can pass it and see each and every platform. So race game average by platform and we'll pass here a platform. And so instead of now mentioning PC, what I'll do, I'll just make a platform and I'll leave this. So now I have this function. So whenever I call this function on any format, so maybe I want to see a format, I forgot which formats are available. <laughs> so maybe I want to see PlayStation. So let's copy this PlayStation from here and I'll call this function PlayStation here. And what happens is now I will get the mean score of all the racing games which are developed in a PlayStation and the score for them is available over here. So we have developed a function to calculate the mean. So next step, what how we will achieve to our target is to use the function which we, we I showed you how to do that. And we can also like apply this function to our uh, whole platforms. So maybe like race game platforms and um, I give this a slot and I say okay map this slot on the uh, all the platforms so you see we, we developed those top 15 platforms we save them here so now I will get the mean of all of those 15 so I can have all of these 15 over here now if I want to see like which one was for which value I can also use a transpose function and I can say okay the first value is the uh, this is the value and the second one is the race platform so by doing this I see okay for PC the average of all the games in the racing category have this average similarly all the cap categories are available over here and you know I always like to uh, see a sorted value so I sort them and see which is the highest one or which one is the lowest one so iPhone has the highest uh, average rating on a racing game and V has oh I was <laughs> I was thinking develop develop a game on V and now I see that the V has the lowest rating on the racing games on average and iPhone has the highest one let's save this as a variable as score rating so we have now done that so now we can also have a like a visual graph of this so maybe we can say okay give me the bar chart so similarly a bar chart of uh, score rating but I want to also see the labels so I use that function called labeled so what label does is the first value is the value of the value I need to draw so I say similarly this is the first value of the score rating and the label will be the second so which is the first this is the first which is a numerical value and the second is the label label will directly come from here so this this will be coming from here and I say this will be the second value and I need to uh, map this on uh, score ratings here score rating and here I go still all jumbled up let's go make the bar or region towards the left I can do right or I can do up 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 like that and this way I can see the so I can see from here the iPhone PlayStation 3 Dreamcast are the few games which these are almost same ratings 
iPhone has the highest rating and then these of that. So based on this now visualization, if I share with you, will you be able to make a good choice? Is V a good choice to make the platform or it is not? Decision is yours. You are the developer. My work is only to show you how to visualize your data, how to get to a certain things. So it all boils down to a thing, how you ask specific questions and how you take it from over here. But in the meantime, what you learned, how to do bar chart. And you can also like maybe change it like plot theme over here. There are mul multiple themes available over here, which you can select from here. So um, I, you see most of time I use this rainbow Uh, the web one and I also use some uh, rainbows because th those gives very beautiful red blue colors so you can select those features from here and you can take it forward from here so this is the uh, we started with the data so you understand where the bra where the bar graphs make sense where the pie charts make sense so whenever you are trying to do some uh, exact value comparisons like exact value comparisons, bar chart makes more sense. But if you are just trying to understand the composition of your data, pie chart makes more sense. And we will summarize that in, in the future exercise also. So let's move, go forward and now we will uh, see more about the uh, distributions. In, in the meantime, if you have any questions, just type your questions in the uh, comment section. Uh, I'm taking a quick look look at that. Still, we do not have any question there. But if there is any question, I'll take an I'll take a quick look at that and try to answer that as well. So, let's uh, move forward now. And uh, now, what we are going to do is we are going to do another exercise where we will learn more about how to do certain type of uh, statistical visualizations using uh, Wolfram language. So, uh, where are these statistical visualization normally used is to understand how your data is distributed and when you want to compare your data sets or distributions among themselves, how your specific data is compared to another data or a distribution of the specific data set, you will be using most of these uh, visualizations in those category as well. So let's go forward and first step is to load the data. So what we are doing over here. So in my every example, I try to give you a different type of how to getting the data from something, from location. So in this example, what we are doing, I'm taking a data from a Wolfram data repository. So if you go on Wolfram data repository, you will see there are a lot more of data available, which you can directly import over here. So I'm going to import a data object from a uh, repository, which has like 150 different flowers categories, 50 from each species of iris. And then we will take, do certain distribution analysis on that as well. So data is imported. Let's review and quickly understand the data. So as we mentioned, there are 150 entries. Let's see how the data is divided we have one species we have petal length for that species we have sepal length for that specific species and where we have sepal width and you see over here in the data set we in this type we also have a unit also like these are mentioned in form of centimeters so why i'm calling over here and mentioning this specifically because in certain types of functions you might need to understand that there might be a string value in your data and how you will take care of that. If you remember in the last session, we use quantity magnitude to uh, take out these uh, units from the data and we might have to use that. But in most of the functions in Wolfram language, it automatically understands if it has any units and try to uh, handle that. Not always, but most of the time. But it will tell you if, if that error comes in. <coughs> So let's group by species and we 
see that. So this is my data. Similarly, in the previous example, we can also now use a group by function and we can say species. So these are the species over here. And you know, you see the advantage of getting a data in a data set in a semantic import is that it automatically identifies. So you don't have to tell, okay, this column, that row, this column or that function. You can just mention the list of rule over here and it will understand that. So we can see that there are three different categories of our iris data and the different values for length, petal length, sepal length or width are available over here. So let's go in and see some of the distributions like which functions are available, what you can see over here. So visualization is important because it will help you understand the parameters such as frequencies, peaks, center modality, and how outliers are available over here. So the histograms are the most simplest way to show the data spread. So how you can see this histogram from this is I'll show you, I have iris data. So I want to see the histogram, I say okay, histogram. And what histogram of which, so if you want to see the pattern length, Petal length, you mentioned there. Any component individually or combined, you can do that. So maybe in the first example, let's take it individually. And I say, okay, I just want to see the petal length, how that is being uh, distributed. And I can have the histogram of the petal lengths for all the three species. The same thing. It, this is the quickest way if you have just to want to see it without any uh, more features or adding more uh, options into this. You can just try, type it like that. But in the past, as we have been doing that, we normally do like this. We have a function like histogram and then we say, okay, we want to see the petal length and we need to map this on this data. So if you, if you know, in all the last examples, we have been using this type of formatting, where we have a function name and then we call a specific feature and we map it on the data. So you can do both ways, depending on how you want to take it further. If I have to add more options, more things, I will prefer using this. If I just want to have a quick view, I can just type in this thing and get a quick view over here. And then I can get the same result. But the advantage of having this over here is I can add some more uh, options into that. So for example, I want to add an option like give me the like, uh, I want to tell that the axis label, what are the axis labels over here? So this has to be capital. And I say, okay, the label is this is the title uh, length and this is in centimeter. And you can see now on the x-axis, I can have this. So the advantage of having this in this format is that you can add more features to the histogram over here. This op option is for quick viewing. Just quickly type in, view it. But if you want to add options, you want to add more features, this is the more preferred way, how I normally would like to do and take it forward from there. Okay, so let's go forward. Let's see what other options you can see. Let's minimize this one. So we have more space on the screen. We can have a bo box whisker chart. So what will the box whisker chart will tell you? It will give you the outliers. It will give you the range, all of these things. And the function name is box whisker chart. And how it is mentioned the same way. I want to see the petal length mapped on this data set. Now, what this is showing over here, if you see, if you hover your mouse on this, it will tell you more information from here. What is the maximum length? What is the, like the 5.1 length is, is within the 75%, the median is 4.35, the minimum value is one. And if there are any outliers over here, those will be represented in forms of a 
So a Bosch Vista chart is very commonly used for statistical analysis when you want to compare different distributions and see how they are distributed or compared together. Another function which is normally used in data visualization is called smooth histogram. So what does smooth histogram show or what is smooth histogram? So in other languages or in normal terms, you might have heard the term like kernel density estimate or KDE. So basically smooth histogram is KDE representation. So I can have a smooth histogram of the petal length in the similar fashion and map it over this data. So normally how I like my these type of graphs is even if I have no other option to think, I always do the filling. It, it gives me a nice impression of how the uh, KDE looks like in this. And Wolfram will call it the smooth histogram. In normal statistical, statistical terms also, the KDE is the kernel density estimate is called smooth histogram. So we, we do have a built-in function for that as well. Similarly, we are not restricted to single column when creating a KDE plot. We can have like a two dimensions. So normally you can have a, a density histogram also. So we can have a smooth density histogram. And because now we have to, it is a density graph, it has to be two dimensional. So we have to give two uh, distributions to it so that it can make that. So maybe the one is the petal length and the other one is we, we know we have simple uh, width maybe on one axis and on the other axis simple width and we'll map this on our data set. So what will happen? Error came in. But you know, the good thing in Wolfram, it exactly tells me what is the error. So in most of above functions, Wolfram automatically understood there are dimensions. In this specific type of that, it is telling me, I need to take care of this dimensions unit because centimeters are not incompatible in this specific function. How I can uh, rectify is just, if I just use the quantity magnitude function of this, I would be able to get the result. And you can see I can have the density plot. So normally how I like in my contour plots or in my density plot is to add a mesh always. So I give the mesh is equal to five. So what it will do, it will give me the five contours for that. Maybe I want to add more things into that, like a plot label, and I say this is the smooth density plot, and I also want to add some frame labels so that to tell you like what is on the x-axis or on the uh, y-axis. You know, while I'm ty typing the syntax, also just by colors, it gives me the ideas if I am missing anything or if I'm writing something in a different length. So on my x-axis is the petal length from here. I know it's on the x-axis. It's in centimeter value. And uh, on the y-axis, I have the sample width, which is also in centimeter. So I can have this. I can have a plot label, I can have axis distribution, I can have some mesh. There are a lot more features available over here also. So if you go on the help, and if, if you see in the help menu, if I write like smooth density histogram, I get all the features over here. So there are basic examples how you can do that and the options available. So there are like almost 38 options which are available over here. So I can go and choose any other options. Like if I have to add a frame on that, how I can do that. If I have to add certain plot points, how can do I can do that. So all of these features or functions are available. I'm just showing you the basics ones which are normally used. But if you want to understand and see 
what other more options are available, you can go into the documentation, look for the other options because there are many options for each and every type of a graph. So for example, even for a smooth density histogram, there are like 38 options you can select from. So you can do this from here. Okay, so these are a couple of ones which we see. Okay, now how to understand the like the dynamics or the distribution characteristics in each species because up till now what we have done we have taken all of these three species together we have not seen these three species separately now what that why that is helpful because if you are trying to uh, develop certain classification models so that will help you understand how your data is uh, distributed and that that will also help you in understanding what type of method to use when you are doing some classification type of uh, or machine learning implementation on this type of specific data set. So let's go and take another example over here. So uh, we will now, so let's take and develop a, a smooth histogram plot. But before that, we need to separate all the data uh, individually. So we, we know that we can separate the data by using group by command and we can say okay uh, separated by species so this will give me all that group data which is divided in all the species but i want to see the histogram for all of that so i use another form wrap this in all in histogram or here and i want to because this is divided in all the all the threes so what I'll say, I'll say, okay, uh, give me all the values and I need to have this based on the petal lengths. So all three uh, groups, but divided into species, but taking into focus into the, the petal length over here. And then I can have the histogram plot for that. So you see it automatically gave different colors. So this is for one distribution, this is for the second species, this is for the third species. But because I have not put any labels yet, so I cannot tell which one is what. So what I can do, I can just quickly go and say, okay, give me the chart legends and let's put them automatically. Automatic is that did I make a many mistake? Let's see. Chart labels and let's put them on the top of each other. Automatic and let's put them on the above. So, okay, okay. So we have the chart labels and we put them placed automatic but above. So this is I know about the Citosa flower. This is for versicular flower and this is for Virginica species. So all the three species are uh, mentioned separately. The chart legend should also work. Let's try, maybe I made any mistake. Oh, I could, yes. So you also see the difference between what chart legends and chart labels are. Legends are always on the side of the graph and the labels are normally right over here. You can place them above, below, or in the center, like over here. So now you can see the distributions for the petal length for a specific is, is far, far away from the others. The classification of them is available. It, it will be good to, I think, to see a smooth histogram for this. So maybe let's uh, take this group by from here. So that we don't have to type it all again. And we see a smooth um, histogram. And we, we know that last time it gave us error for the quantity magnitude. So we did it quantity magnitude. Okay, so we have a bit long values. So plot range goes to all 
you know I love the filling so let's go filling by oh, axis so you you see there's a very interesting pattern over here so the length of this specific species Sitosa is very unique and different from the lens of these two species. So for example, if I am doing a machine learning, okay, so what will happen? If I have to classify any petal length from this um, species, I would have a more better result as opposed to uh, the these two species, which are versicolor and uh, virginicia, because they, they, they are, most of the, those are overlapping. This is separately. So just looking at the uh, your data, you can also infer certain things which are hidden within them, which you cannot see just by looking at the data set. Just by looking at data set, I cannot make anything out of that. But using certain type of visualizations, you can see I can quickly understand the un underlying insights hidden within them and how I can now aesthetically use them and I can present them to anyone else also. So this topic was more on the uh, distributions. So let's go, let's see if you have any questions. I do not see any questions yet. So let's go and see if we can do with another example. Okay. So let's start with the another example, the our third example for the day. And what this example is based on is, you know, I asked every one of you to fill this form. So all of you must have filled this data visualization form. So what this form has done, it has asked you to do do certain data entry like give me your name your email address country or organization are you a student or you are from any other uh, or what your occupation is and based on this data now what i'm doing once you register this everything was going into my data bin so what i have done i had a data bin and this is the name of the data bin it's private to me so i hope you won't be able to get the data from there so I can call this values directly from my data bin into this variable and I'm just hiding it so that I don't want every one of you to see what data I get from here because some of many of you have not given the consent and we can see that. Now why I'm showing you this example is uh, under these situations you might be developing certain quizzes, you might be developing certain survey forms where you will uh, ask your viewers or ask your students to submit something to you through the cloud object and you save them in the data bin. And now how quickly I can get that data from the data bin and do certain type of analysis. It can be quizzes result, it can be numbers, it, it, can, it can be survey results, it can be anything. So it, it really depends upon your creativity, how you develop it and what type of data you are calling it. So I'm calling the values from this data bin and I'm saving it in a variable. So once I have this, I can also see, I have like 136 entries specific into this data. And I'll just show the first value because I know this person has given me the uh, consent to share their information. So just to give you an idea how this is, all of all of the information is now available into my notebook. So once this information is available, I can do certain types of data visualization or explorations on that. So the first thing, if I want to see how is the composition of the uh, people who are attending to this session, so I can have the pie chart for that. And I'm not gonna, I'm just write it over here. So what this is doing, this is giving me the, let me write it over here. So I have this, uh, tally of the oh, let's let's we are running out of time so let's quickly so I'm going to do a pie chart and I labeled it by these two and it will giving me the registration data by the seventh one so here one two three four five six 
7. So mean the consent. So I'm looking how many of the people gave me the consent. So I could have another type of graph also as well, but because I want to see the composition, so I can completely see that majority of the people have given me the consent to share their data for this specific uh, thing if, if I want to. But don't worry, I, I'm not showing any uh, private detail on the screen right now. But just to give you an idea how you can quickly do the consent. See what happens if you do a similar thing on a sixth value. And I can have a 3D chart. So I can see quickly what is the occupations of the people. So I can see most of my people coming over here in the sessions are students. Then we have some people from the commercial or research professions. We have very few from the uh, high schools or community college and from the business side. Very few from the in the category of hobbies. So academic and students. So mostly academic people are mostly today in our today's uh, session. So I can quickly look at this composition and I can have a 3D chart. So the advantage of 3D chart is I can zoom in, zoom out, I can rotate around and see what type of visualization I want to see. Similarly, if I want to compare anything like hardcore values, so what I'm going to compare over here is how many are from different countries. Because I can use a composition over here, but I want to use, I want to see the exact values relationship coming from each country. So I can see most of my people are coming from different three categories or three, uh, four countries over here. That's a good mix, like people from all over. And then I can have the maps also. So what the geolist plot will do, I say, okay, give me South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand and it will highlight for me. So these are the three major countries I can quickly see over here. And because I have the data available over here also, which is telling me how many from each country, so I can also map them on a georegion plot where I have like the values over here. So I can see from here more, where the most of my uh, participants or registrants for this session are coming from. So just to give you an idea how quickly you can form uh, data from in the database, collect it into your notebook and you can do quickly some time of visualization or analysis. And this can be quick for your surveys, for your quizzes in the class, you distribute a link, they do it, you just make a quick uh, schedule for that, execute it and you get the live results, fetch those live results from there. So this was the third example. So we are running out of time. I'll try to uh, speed up a little bit. So what I'm going to show you next is about financial visualizations. And in this financial visualizations, in the first example, I'm going to show you how you can utilize the built-in data within Wolfram language. And the second part is I'm going to do analysis on the uh, I'm going to show you the analysis on how you can uh, get the stock data if it is not available in Wolfram language. You can import it into Wolfram language and how you can do that. And I think uh, we have I have I was shared a data from uh, uh, Yahoo Finance and it was on the Samsung stock data and we'll do that exercise. So if if it is a built-in data, I can quickly write like financial data and I can call the uh, link sticker for the Apple and I can get the real lifetime data. So currently the in US dollar value, the Apple stock value is this. Similarly, we see we can have a date list plot. So all I'm going to do is the financial data calling within Mathematica and I'd say, okay, I just want to see it for 2020. And when I execute that, I can have a list line plot. I can see there's a huge dip in the merge of mark. And now again, the price of Apple is going to pick up. Similarly, we can have a Kagi chart. So we can have an also Kagi chart for 2000. So Kagi chart is more, and you can see it, it automatically tells green in red colors for going up, going down. It, it automatically tips the different colors. 
Similarly, I can have a candlestick chart. The advantage of candlestick chart is that it will show you all the open values, close values, high values as well on that specific day. So I can see all the close value and the open values here. But there's a, another very good function which is called the trading chart. So trading chart shows, will also show you the volume on each and every day. So it will show you the candlestick chart, but on the below, you see there is a specific volume. And if you hover on any specific day, it will tell you what is the open value, what was the higher value, uh, lower value, closing value, and the specific date. So, and, this, and the corresponding volume. So this function is built in. You can uh, utilize this built-in function. Similarly, you can have an interactive. So what interactive trading chart is give you something, an interactive model where you have all these same thing which were in the trading chart, open, high, close, volume, but you have something you can select more range. You can choose within certain categories, zoom in, zoom out, as well as all the options. So if you want to have another type or any, any other indicator mapped on this. So for example, this is the information, but you want to have more information on top of that. You say, okay, I want to see the moving averages. So you can say, okay, either want to use all of these options like simple moving, exponential, double moving average, envelopes. If you add over here, you see now on the same data, you have the moving average and the value is also coming on top of it. So interactive trading chart is very useful if you are into the stock market and you want to visualize and see how this uh, specific stock is behaving. Now, many people have come and say, okay, Farid, this is very good, I, we can do this. But the problem over here is that this is only available to those people or for the US stock market. Now, what happen if we, if we do not have, because, you know, Wolfram cannot know or do not have the data for all of these stock exchanges. But if you have access to Bloomberg Terminal, you know, you can always install a, a Wolfram Finance platform on top of a Bloomberg Terminal. The advantage of them is then you will be getting real term data. So even if you do not have Wolfram, uh, if you do not have Bloomberg Terminal, you have an offline data, like in form of an Excel sheet or a CSV sheet, you can also you import that into uh, Mathematica and do the same trading chart, interactive charts on those as well. And that is my next example is. So let's move forward and let's look at that example. So uh, let's take that example. Where is my bar sheet? Here it is. So I want to show you this. Let me, okay. Okay. So let's do this. And while doing that, I'm going to show you one more technique, how you are going to get your data in an, another way also. So for example, if I write something like, okay, let me zoom in a little bit. Not like this. So let's zoom this a little bit. And I say, if I write like notebook directory, it will tell me in which directory I'm currently sitting in, okay? And if I uh, do like file names, and I want to see what type of files are available, so tell me these are the two files available in this directory. So rather than me going and finding, or if you save this notebook and this Excel file in the same, uh, uh, in the same folder and you share it with someone or you move the folder around, it will, everything will work uh, without making any changes over here. And if I do like file name uh, join, so I'm doing a notebook directory. And I join this with uh, uh, this file. So this is my this file. Right here. So what will happen? 
So now I have the complete string or the address. And now I can import this. Import function, import this. And you know, whenever I import this, I always like to do data and I always like to say the first sheet because if I know my data, I know this is available in the first sheet over, over there. So this, my data has come over here. Let's call this KS raw data. And let's So let's see at this data. First five values as usual. Now, in the start, you know, I told you there's a two different ways of importing. I can import or I can do semantic import. But you, you notice I have imported over here. So what happens? There is no associations linked over here. So what happened if I even now want to make certain associations between the first headers and the seconds. I can still do that. So maybe I can make an association thread. So what association thread does, it will map two values correspondingly. So maybe I want to say, okay, the first of this KS raw I want to map this or I want to make an association thread of the first line, which is the headings over here with the rest of them. And with the rest of them, because there are multiple, so I use a slot function and I map this on the rest of the PS row. And I make this a data set also so that it is and save this as a variable may be called uh, ps data now you see i have the association thread where i have the headings and i have the corresponding values so i can look at the data we have date we have open high low close and the volume on that specific date Let's look at the length of the data. Uh -oh. This time is running and my speed is also. <laughs> yeah. So let's, I think this is very important. If you can stay, we are going to have a very fun because the next step will be also telling you what type of uh, chart to use on which data set. But this equation, this uh, exercise itself is very important because it will tell you how you can do all of those things on a, on, on a data which is imported by you. So I can see I can be, I have almost like 1200 data entries. I can quickly have a date list plot. So I'll do the same things which I did in the brief previous section with the built-in Wolfram data. I'm going to do that in the same. So I need to have a date list plot between which two variables? I can select over here because it's a date list plot. So one variable has to be date. What I want to see, I want to see volume, close, high, low, anything, I can select from here. So let's do a list plot between date and the open value. So I can say, okay, I want to have date and I want to have the open value of that day. And you can see I can have a date list plot where I have dates on the x-axis and I have the stock values over here. So I can have a date list plot. Now, let's go forward and do the candlestick chart. So what we'll do over here is we'll do candlestick chart. Now, what are the, how the candlestick chart is written is if you go over here and you can see from here, what does the candlestick chart is? So we have a date and then we have to give open, high, low and close. And if we give these values, I will have a candlestick chart. So we have date, open, high, low and close. Let's go forward. So we will have 
this value over here. So we'll I will say okay, candlestick data on the PS data, and I want to have what I want to have date, and then how it was written. The second thing was open. Then we had to give high. Then we have to give low, and then we have to give close values for this. And then we have to map this on it. Let's see what happens if we do this. Oh, there is an error. Now why there is an error? So once you have received an error, it's working. Here it's giving an error. We need to go back, look into the data. Let's see what we have in our data that is giving us this specific error. So if I go on this my data set over here, and I try to see my data set over here, it, okay, there are some zero values, but it should not matter. It should, the Wolfram language is smart enough to handle these types of things if there is any missing value or something like value, but we need to take care of that. Let's look at some of the things if we can find out. Oh, there are some null values over here. Okay, so we need to take care of these issues as well. So let's see if we can quickly take a look and see what other issues we might have. So we, we notice we have some null values and we have some zero values over here. So we need to take care of them. As I mentioned, some places like this function in the date list plot, Wolfram language was smart enough to manage that. But some functions, it is giving an error. So we need to take care of those null values and we need to take care of those missing values in our data set. So what I'm going to do over here, so where I made this uh, data set association between both of them, what I'm going to do over here, I'm making a replace all function. I say replace, so this is the shortcut for replace all. Wherever there was null written, in the string, I want that to be replaced with a function called missing. No, because now I will be able to handle that. So now what I've done, all those null values in my data set have been changed into this header function. So at least now I have a header function over here. The advantage of that is that when I come over here, now I will take care of all those values which have the missing header over there. So basically what I'm going to do over here, I'll say, okay, give me the, I will use over, I'll say delete, oh, this function will come, delete cases, cases. What type of cases I need to delete, I'll tell over here. So anything which is have like zero or which has a missing header should be avoided. And I also want to have the normal values. I don't want to see the data set. So I will have the normal of this. So now let's see what happens. Oh, perfect, it works. So now I have a candlestick chart. It's working on your own data set, imported through an Excel file. You can get it from Yahoo Finance or anywhere you have, you have that, you can do that. Now, can I do the same thing on like the trading chart? So let's do and use that trading chart. Now, I also need to understand how the trading chart is written. So if I go over here, I can see how the trading chart function I have to enter. It will have a date, open, high, low, close. I have all the, oh, I also need the volume because the trading chart have a volume bar below. So I need to have the volume over here as well. So what I'll do, I'll just copy this everything from here and place it here. And after close, I will add another thing which is called 
because I have that data as well. And you see, now I have a trading chart where I have the open, high, low, close, and the volume on the corresponding dates. All of this information is available. Now if I have to change it into an interactive trading chart, I can also do that because the input of interactive trading chart is also all of these things. And because that is all data I have, I have all the data available over here. So I can make an interactive trading chart over here. So now I can have all of these things like I can see by week, I can see by month, or the maximum values, or I can change it from a different set. I can only want to see like 2019 to 2020. I can have a different chart type, different ways of seeing it, and all those indicators. So all those things which I need now is now available over available to me and I can do that. So it doesn't matter if the data is available or coming to you either through fall from built-in data. So do not come back to me and say, Fareed, why wall from do not have all the data? If you can get the data, I told you now how to use the same functionality on your data, which you can also implement directly if Wolfram knows about that data available into your notebook. So this is now available to you. So this is the my fourth example gone. So now let's come to our last topic. Let's summarize what we have learned in these last two sessions and what is my take or my advice on what type of visualizations to use and when. So whenever you have to compare between two things or you want to have a find the trend of the things, line charts are very suitable for that. So there are many, many there are many functions available in Wolfram language. We only covered a few and I'll only tell them about those. So we use list line plot, we use date list plot and we use list step plot. And these charts are good if you want to show trends over a period of time. Either they can be multiple data sets, single data set, or you want to compare the trends between two. Line charts are good for that. You can use bar charts if you want to compare the exact values, like this value of three is compared to four, five, the exact relationship of the different groups or categories you want to visualize, bar charts are good for that. Then you can, I also shared with you multi-axis chart. Somewhere where you want to compare two trends, it's not a, basically a comparison, but you can have a different uh, axis on one side and you can have a different axis on the other side. It's not directly a relationship or used for compare variables, but it's a nice way to have multiple, uh, to show exact uh, uh, trends, how the trends are compared. Not the exact comparison, but the exact trends are shown. So you can use these three types if you have to compare something. If you have to show relations, we studied scatter plot and we, in the last session, and we used the list plot, how to see the, uh, different uh, BMIs, insurance, and those. If you have not attended the first session, the recording is available online. Uh, I suggest you go and see that recording. You will understand what uh, the scatter charts are used for. If you have some, want to show some correlations or you want to show some distribution analysis, it's good for showing those relations or how they are correlated to each other. There are other charts like bubble charts and all others are also available, but because we didn't do that, so I, I, I didn't mention them over here. Now, if you have to visualize certain distributions, so we studied histograms, which is like this generic way of uh, showing a, uh, uh, the statical dist uh, distribution. Or you can have a, so the problem with histogram might be to select the size of the bin. So in, in Wolfram, the best thing is that it automatically uh, finds a suitable bin for you but if you have a larger bin, all of this would be one data. So to avoid that, you can have smooth histograms or you can have the density histogram if you have to compare between different data sets. Or then we studied about the box whisker chart, which will tell you the different variations, median, minimum, maximum values, as well as the outliers 
available for each category. Boss message chart is useful for that. Then if you want to do uh, understand the composition, we saw how we can use compositions using pie chart. And we also saw in the first session how we use the stack list plot to understand the compositions. Then for the map charts, if you want to use just show the maps or you want to map certain value on that, you can have a geo list plot or you can have the geo region value plot. So there you assign a different specific value and you can do that. So these are the couple of ways. And if you are wondering what type of graph this is, so this is a tab view graph. So basically what tab view works is there's a function called tab view. And I say, okay, there are, these are my headings and they are compared basically to a variable. And each one here is a variable and this is so trend view. So tab view is also a nice way if you are giving a presentation and you want to show how your specific uh, things you want to all combine them all together in one place, you can do uh, that in, uh, uh, in um, tab view also. So let's see if we have anything else to say. Is there any question? Okay. So there is a question about uh, if you can share any BI dash, okay, business intelligence dashboard using Mathematica. So I do not have exactly a pre built uh, example, but I, I told you the, the, I showed you one example. Uh, let me see if I can pull that back. So here is, uh, okay, let me show you this example. So this is an example, maybe you can see. So basically what it is doing, it's just making a cloud object. Similarly to this object I, I made over here, uh, this was my object also. You see, this is an object. It's coming, the data is coming, the pictures are coming in this way. It, it, this specific example is more static, asking for the data. But if you go on Wolfram website, it's also an object, but this is more like a BI dashboard where you, where you can have. So this is the, which graph is this? This is the geo value region plot. So I have a geo value region plot. I have some text written over here. I have a data set representing over here. I have a trend showing like a line chart with the plot labels, with the legends. So, so I have now told you all the basic ingredients of how to make all these small components. Now, the next step will be to just combine, combine them together into a cloud object. That itself is a huge topic. So I cannot cover that in just one or five minutes or six seconds. What I'll do, I'll maybe develop a, a specific uh, lecture on that in which we can see, because in that case, I do not have to show you how these graphs are made. You know, this is a geo region plot. This is a line chart. Now, how you can bring it into here, you can do that also. So if you go into wall from, uh, let me show you the example over here. Uh, my line bar go <laughs> keep on, Okay, so if I go over here and I say cloud object. So here you will get all the information how you can develop your cloud objects yourself. There will be examples over here how you can develop your cloud object. So normally what I do is I use a form function. How you can develop a form function over here these forms and within this is um, it's it's called uh, uh, API appearance maybe API function so cloud object preparation is a complete topic in itself and I'll try to cover that whole in in a maybe in in my next session what I want to uh, say uh, in the uh, some of the things is uh, I've already done a step-by-step -step guide of performing uh, COVID-19 data. So if you want to visualize how I have done uh, the COVID-19 data, it's also available on my uh, channel. You can uh, look for that. Uh, it, I have also tried to make it very basic and I took very small steps so that you can also learn from them. 
In addition to that, I want to tell you all that uh, uh, if you have not renewed your premier service, please do so, do, do that because that uh, will come with the uh, access with the Mathematica online also subscription. So that will help you to develop all these cloud objects because cloud credits are available through that every month. And uh, if your if you if your Mathematica license is not at the current latest version, Wolfram is currently running a promotion as well, where you can uh, do uh, do the upgrade and get the online access for. Uh, it's more than a 50% saving. So if you really want to use it for remote working, working from home, uh, this is the time to avail that up upgrade promotion. You can contact your local uh, distributors in your country to get that. Uh, yeah, the advantage of that uh, campaign. Otherwise, you can also write me and I can contact you with the concerned person also. So in addition to that, if you have any other topics you are interested to learn, to know about, like uh, I'm currently developing a new course on solving equation solving and linear algebra for quantum computing in uh, word from language. So if you want to uh, know about that, when, when I'll be doing those lectures on uh, those, you, you please subscribe to this channel and you will get the notification when I'll when, when I'll be uploading those uh, lectures online. So uh, looking at the questions, I do not see any more questions yet. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly or your local distributor. Uh, with that, uh, uh, the recording will be available of this session online also. So with that, let's end this session today. Thank you for uh, staying with me today. I, I am I, I sh I'm, I'm sorry that I took an extra 30 minutes of your valuable time, but I hope that uh, uh, this was the, uh, I hope this was the best utilization of your time today. At least for me, I, I've shared a lot of uh, valuable information and I wish you all the best and have a great day. Please remember to subscribe if you have not subscribed that so you get all the upcoming notifications of my upcoming uh, examples as well as sessions online. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.